Today, I am joined by Weldon Long, who is up in beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado. How are you doing, Weldon? Yeah, I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for Skyping. Looking forward to this. Yeah, and for those of you who may not know Weldon, he is, uh, and a lot of you already do, he is a New York Times bestseller with the power of consistency. Um, he's an entrepreneur, a sales expert. He has driven Fortune, fi- Fortune 5,000 companies to unbelievable um, heights in revenue generation. So Weldon really looks, really knows what he's talking about. And what I wanted to ask Weldon about today was about his book the power of consistency and and why is consistency so important for sales number one and second why is it something that perhaps we overlook a lot of the time yeah that, that's a great question you know i think the the, uh, the benefit of consistency is very simple we all know that uh, consistent sales activities produce consistent sales results random sales activities <laughs> produce random sales results right it's not rocket science mm-hmm. if you think about the operations uh, and manufacturing side of business, uh, let's take a, com- a computer chip manufacturer. If they use kind of a random process in their engineering and their development and the manufacturing of their chips, they just kind of walk in the factory each day and sometimes they do this and sometimes they do that. We all know that the quality of the computer chip would be really, really bad. would have a lot of unhappy customers. So we understand instinctively from a manufacturing operations perspective that we have to have a process. Unfortunately, when it comes to sales, we don't apply that same level of the need for consistency. We oftentimes think that we can just kind of show up on a sales call and just, you know, uh, rely on our wits and our communication skills. The problem is, if we don't have a consistent sales process, we're not going to have consistent sales results. Uh, In other words, when you look at a sales process, kind of the basic four components, build a relationship, investigate the problem, solve the problem, ask for the order. If we're random in that process, then we're going to get the same kind of results that the manufacturing facility would get if they had a random (laughs) manufacturing process. We're going to have very inconsistent sales results. So when I talk to salespeople, you know, it's like if if your process uh, or your results, rather, if your results are sometimes good and sometimes bad and sometimes good and some that is by definition random results. Yeah. Those random results are not coming from consistent sales act. I totally agree with you. So why is it then um, that in some areas of sales there has been this resistance to the idea of process or consistency? And some people will hide that behind the, ah, you know, it's a kind of an art and I do it my way and they do it their way. And I just, you know, I don't want to interfere with it. And process is for other people. It's not for us. Well, I think that uh, it's a great question, John. Listen. Salespeople, we tend to be a little bit more on the creative side versus, you know, the the organized side, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's kind of what makes us good. We have great communication skills. We can schmooze. We can kiss hands. We can shake babies or whatever that (laughs) saying is. We can do all that stuff. And we kind of look at, you know, a sales process as being put in a straitjacket, right? Mm -hmm. Zig Ziglar used to often say that if you don't have uh, a sales process, in other words, if you don't have a process, you have to have what he called a canned presentation to be successful in sales. Now, if it sounds like a canned presentation, you're going to be toast, right? But you have to have a process. I think we resist it. Uh, There's two reasons. Number one, I think we see ourselves as more creative uh, communicators, and we don't like the restrictions, uh, the uh, kind of the the process uh, kind of puts on us. We've got to be in a straitjacket. But I think the other thing is, and this is a big part of my book, both in The Power of Consistency and my new book, Consistency Selling, the bottom line is that we all face challenges in life. And those challenges come down to three types, money problems, relationship problems, and health problems. And the key to success in sales, the key to success in life, is learning how to prosper in the face of those challenges, right? It's not that successful people somehow avoid money problems or avoid relationship problems or avoid health problems. It's that they're very good at dealing with those things. And what happens oftentimes is that we're going out, we're making a sales call, and we have some personal problem or some financial problem, and it distracts us, and so we just kind of wing it. The, the, the key to success is learning how to prosper in all areas of our life in the face of those challenges. That's what I really talk about in both of those books. Uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you thrive and prosper in the face of adversity? My life, is, my, my life has been a textbook example of adversity. I spent 25 years of my life on the streets. Uh, I spent 13 years in prison. When I was 40 years old, I was living in a homeless shelter. So I know all about adversity. And what I've learned is that if you can learn to deal with that adversity 
and prosper in the face of that. That's where success comes in. In terms of the process, consistency has kind of two folds, and we can talk about these in detail. Number one is the salesperson, uh, sales professional doing the same things over and over. The second component of consistency is from the consistency theory, right? So if I tell you as a customer, if I tell you that price is not the most important factor in my decision, mm-hmm. and then an hour later I start you know, complaining about the price, right. then those are inconsistent statements. And the key is to hold prospects accountable to their previous declarations. So, uh, and, and it's an interesting thing about the adversity piece, right? Because sales is all about adversity, right? Because I yeah. mean, it's the one, it's the one, uh, it's the one job where no is pr- you hear no more than anything else, right? So, what is the key to learning how to face up to adversity rather than um, outsource it, if you like, or just say, "Oh well, there's nothing I could do." You know, the reality is every time we come into a sales opportunity, there's going to be difficulties, right? There's going to be obstacles. We're going to have customers who want a cheaper price. We're going to have customers who want to think about it. We're going to have customers who want to talk to our competition. The key in sales, just like in life, is learning how to thrive in the face of those obstacles. The key to that is to have proactive discussions with our prospects. Proactive discussions. So, for example, let's say I was selling you a new car. Then before I start talking to you about selling you a new car, I'm going to ask you a simple question. I'm going to say, John, uh, in, in the course of buying a new car, I'm sure that price is going to be something that you consider. That's going to be one of the things that you evaluate, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to share with you an article from Edmunds.com that talks about the 10 most important factors that we should consider when buying a new car. And as you can see here, price is number six. You know, the reputation of the service department, uh, the, the, the appropriate the type of car for your needs, and all these are the factors. So let me ask you, John, would you agree or disagree with, with Edmunds.com that there are a few factors that are as important, perhaps even more important, than a cheap price? Yeah. So if I get you to make that concession up front, now an hour later I'm trying to sell you a car, mm-hmm. and I'm going to ask you to sign the paperwork on a car, and I want you to raise the price objection. So, John, this is the car I'm going to recommend. This is a perfect car for you and your family based on everything I've learned about you and the time we've spent together. So the only question I have is, will you trust me with this recommendation for a car? Uh, I'm still a bit, still a bit off on the price. No, it, it's a big decision, John. I understand that completely. But you know, earlier you had mentioned that you agree with Consumer Reports that price was not the most important factor in your decision. Has that changed in our time together? Um, no, 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 not that you come to mention it. It hasn't really. Well, great. With your permission, I'd like to start the paperwork. <laughs> So the key there is public declarations dictate future actions, and it's based on a a psychological principle of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And I looked down at my watch, it is 3 o'clock, and I forgot. I'm like, oh, I forgot to pick up John. Mm -hmm. That anxiety is called dissonance. When humans feel dissonance, we want to get rid of it. So what do I do? I pick the phone up, and I say, John, I'm going to be late. I'm sorry. I'll be there. But I do something to get back into a state of residence so I can feel better about who Mm -hmm. I am as a person. The same rules apply in sales. If I can get you to acknowledge price is not the most important factor, and then you bring it up later, I simply remind you right. of our previous conversation, you're going to experience dissonance, right? Because you did say that an hour ago, mm-hmm. and you're going to feel anxiety. Well, as the sales professional, I'm simply going to ask you for the order again, which is metaphorically throwing you a life preserver so you can make a decision that's consistent with your previous actions, right? It's not exactly rocket science. Right. But it's about using psychological principles and the sales principles to achieve the results that we want at the end game. And what I like about that, Weldon, is the fact that uh, you, you, as you said, I mean, you didn't sit around as a lot of, you know, a lot of people when they're in a selling situation, they're dreading the obstacle coming up. They're dreading the objection coming up. You were like, okay, I'm going to just meet it head on. I'm going to deal with it early. And and then I'm going to have a fallback position later if it, uh, if it rears its ugly head again. But what I'm not going to do is avoid it. Right. You know, people operate on the misconception that that effective sales is about high pressure. Mm -hmm. Effective sales is not about high pressure. Effective sales, John, is about high service. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to extend ourselves professionally and emotionally to our customers. Part of that extension is that I have to, you know, kind of have some insight into what I know what the objections are going to be. If you're selling your CRM, for example, uh, that that, that your company... uh, uh, Produces, it sells whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what the objections are every time that you're going to sell it. 
there's probably two or three or four that you're going to face on 80% of your calls. Mm -hmm. We should never be caught flat foot. We should never be caught, right, uh, unaware. We have to anticipate those. And as you said, not dread those coming up, but anticipate those coming up and approach them with like, I knew this was coming. I know what you're thinking before what you're thinking because I sell you know, software 10 times a day. You buy it once every 10 years. <laughs> I should know more about what the objections are going to be than you do. So it's about anticipating that. That's about the hard work of sales. Mm -hmm. That is where consistency comes in. I know exactly what I'm going to say depending on what objections that I anticipate that you're going to raise. Yeah. And I think one of the other pieces about consistency, Weldon, and I don't know if you agree, is that there's there's nothing worse than if you have an experience with a salesperson and then maybe you get the sale, maybe you sell me the car or whatever. And this has happened to me personally. And then I call you up a week later because there's an issue with it and you're a completely different person, right? Right. So, well, I mean, how, how important is it to, because I always say like chameleons make, you know, great pets and they're lovely to look at and everything, but in salespeople, they can be, uh, it can be devastating. Right. Listen, and this is part of the extending ourselves emotionally and professionally. You're not just my customer before you sign on the line that is dotted. A year out of the homeless shelter, I, I started a heating and air conditioning company. Now, I don't know the first thing about heating and air conditioning, but I know how to sell. Mm -hmm. So I started this company. And I focused on the marketing and sales. I hired the operations people. And by the way, I grew that company to $20 million in revenue in five years. In 2009, we were selected as one of Inc. Magazine's fastest growing companies. But the core foundation of that company is I offered what I call the one-year test drive. Right? So, John, again, we'll role play and say, you're my customer, you're my homeowner. I say, John, have you ever bought something from a department store you didn't like? A mm -hmm. piece of clothing, a flashlight, or something like that? Sure. And you decided you wanted to return that item. What happened when you went back to the store? Did they did they shun you? Did they turn you out the door? Or did they give your money back or a new product? Whatever you wanted. Yeah, no, that was a pretty simple process. Exactly. Well, I decided it should be the same way in the heating and air conditioning industry. So, John, what I'm going to do is to extend this offer of a one-year test drive. I'm going to put in a brand new heating and air conditioning system, and I don't want you to buy it tonight. I want you to try it for a year, 11 months and 29 days. At the end of that process, anytime during that first year, if you decide the system doesn't work properly, you don't get proper service, you don't like the way someone from my company treated you on the phone, I will offer you the opportunity with one phone call to me, no brain damage, I will remove that system and refund 100% of your initial investment. Now, John, what does that say about the level of quality and service I'm going to offer you if I have that kind of responsibility on my shoulders? Well, I mean, obviously, you're going to you're going to turn over every stone to make sure that you're the best quality of service in all areas and in every interaction the customer has with your business, right? Exactly. So, John, now if you call me a month later, two months later, the problem, I have a responsibility and obligation. I got to make sure you're happy. Mm -hmm. I can't be that chameleon all of a sudden like, who are you? What's the name? John who? <laughs> I, I've got to make sure that you are taken care of because I have a responsibility, you know, that I have to extend to you. So did you ever actually have to take a system out? That's a, a wonderful question and the best question. The reality is in $20 million in sales in five years, I never had to return a system. I will tell you there were a few opportunities where I did it because I wanted to. Sure. I remember, for example, we had a customer. Her name was Sarah Parker. We installed a very expensive system, a very high-efficiency system. And about eight months later, she calls me up and she wanted us to come and install a, a less expensive system and refund her the difference. When I, I said, well, what's wrong with the system? She said, nothing's wrong with the system, but I've been diagnosed with cancer and I'm having to leave my job for treatment. I got to sell my house. I'm trying to get all my money together. When I understood what happened, the situation she was in, I said, Sarah, you keep the system and let me refund the difference. And so I didn't have to, but I did it. By the way, the letter that I got from Sarah Parker, in my estimation, was worth $20 million because that letter was the foundation of my sales process. We have to sell with integrity. We have to deliver service with integrity. One of my mentors uh, was Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits mm -hmm. of Highly Effective People. And I learned some, you know, as I often say, values are knowing what to do. Character is having the strength to do it. And integrity is doing it when the when push comes to shove, right? Mm -hmm. The rubber meets the road. You have to be. And by the way, I would tell all of our business owners, sales professionals out there that the way I looked at that kind of return of, of money as marketing money, because it was the best marketing sure. money I could ever spend because my next 10 customers, next 100 customers, they were going to hear about that story and they were going to read that letter with me. I promise you. 
So, I mean, so as, you, as, as you've outlined um, beautifully here, there is a huge economic value to consistency, right? To the consistency of whether you're just an individual salesperson or an organization. But take it down to the level of a salesperson, right? If you, if you provide a consistent level of service and really well to, if I do that to you, right, then you're likely to uh, recommend me. But I have to deliver that to every single person who recommends me, right? I have to deliver it to the next person, the next person, the next person. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's really important. Listen, people all communicate in different ways. Some people read and learn. Some people watch videos. Some mm -hmm. people hear. Some people are tactile learners, right? They, they, they learn by touching things. Some people learn through emotion and stories. So when I create a sales presentation for an organization, I incorporate every form of communication into the sales presentation. Mm -hmm. The reason I do that is I don't know for sure what a particular customer, I don't know how they're going to connect with me. Are they connecting to the story? Are they connecting to the product demonstration? Are they connecting to what they're seeing or reading? You never know for sure. So we incorporate all of these forms of communication to a prospect. If I have consistency and I do my sales process the same way every time, I'm going to hit every one of those communication medium, right? So I'm going to connect with you at some point. If I start picking and choosing which part of the presentation I'm going to use, I may skip the form of communication that would have won you over. Right. So that's why I say you can't be random in this process. You have to hit every form of communication with your prospects. They have to see pictures. They have to hear, hear stories. They have to touch products and, and experience products. They have to get emotional. They have to have logic. They have to have all these various things. Because I'm going to connect with you on one of those. If I start randomly deciding I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, I might miss the one thing that would have won you over as a customer. So at the essence of what you're, uh, a lot of the essence of what you're talking about here is obviously, you know, consistency of execution, but it's preparation and planning too, right? Because you can't be consistent. You can't do what you just said about having a presentation that hits all the different, uh, you know, learning styles or whatever, or information receiving styles, unless you've done your homework. Right. But here's an example right here on my desk. This is uh, for a $50 million company in California, and I developed their presentation book. And their job is to go through this book, tell the stories I teach them to tell, uh, ask the questions I teach them to ask, and throughout the course of these 10 or 15 pages, we're going to touch on every one of those communication uh, uh, methods, right? I'm going to connect with somebody at some point. I do the same thing with FedEx. I do the same thing with Farmers Insurance. I do the same thing with Wells Fargo. You got to communicate and do it the same way every single time. If you if you manufacture computer chips and you do it randomly, you're going to have really poor quality results. Yeah, and what about with um, you know when a a prospect or whatever starts to take you off track and you've starting starting to feel like oh I'm 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 never going to get to these pieces or I'm going to miss something and you know, like I, I'm obviously I'm trying to be accommodating here and go down this you know rabbit hole with them. How do you how do you advise salespeople to control that situation as best they can, given the fact that you have to react? to the customer great 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 question number number one i rely on the process because if i'm following a process and let's say i'm on page five of my process now again it can't sound like a process mm -hmm. it can't sound like a canned presentation but let's say the phone rings and the prospect gets distracted with some other issue in their business or if i'm in home sales one of the kids comes in the room crying for mommy right when the dust settles on that distraction i can bring them right back where i was Right? So I stay on the path. Mm -hmm. The other issue, you mentioned the rabbit holes. This is a really important uh, issue. I'm glad you brought it up. You don't have to chase every rabbit down every hole. A lot of times when people, especially when you're using consistency theory to sell, when I reminded you, for example, earlier that you said price wasn't the most important, mm -hmm. one of the most common things that home uh, prospects will do is they feel that nervous energy because, hey, I did say that an hour ago. And they'll start going down rabbit holes. Oh, well, i got to go on vacation next week. And my brother-in-law, i got to talk to him. And my kid's got to go to the doctor. And they'll come up with every distraction. All you have to do is to, when they finish speaking, acknowledge, yes, I understand it's important to get your child to the doctor. I, important, I understand it's important to go see your brother-in-law. However, with your permission, what do you say we start the paperwork? And so I ignore... The distractions, because when people get nervous, it's a very uh, common human behavior. We get nervous and we ramble, mm -hmm. right? And people will do that. The problem is with sales professionals, sometimes those ramblings, which are just kind of nervous energy, we start taking those as legitimate objections. And we start, next thing we know, well, well, when are you coming back from vacation? When are you getting back to the doctor? And we go on these, these rabbit holes like you're talking about, and next thing you know, we're having a different conversation. 
So you have to stay on rails, especially when you get to the closing sequence, right? Because that's the most common time people will try to distract you and get you off. Mm -hmm. you got to be on rails. you got to know exactly what you're going to say during your closing sequence, and you have to stay focused. Whatever obstacles come up, you simply remind them of what they said earlier and come back and ask for the order. And, and that is about preparation, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. right? If I go back to Stephen Covey, the four quadrants of time, quadrant two is planning, preparation, and prevention. We have to take the time to practice, role play, prepare ourselves so when those objections come up, we're on rails, right? We don't get distracted because we're the professionals. Mm -hmm. We sell whatever we sell every single day. Your customer probably buys it once every few years, maybe once in a lifetime. Right, yeah. and I think that's an that's an important thing to add. There is that idea of when you do get down to the end of the process, and as you say, maybe I only buy it once or a year or twice. Maybe this is the, maybe it's in a B two B. Maybe this is the first time the company has trusted me to make a big purchase. And there's a lot of emotion attached. There's a lot on my back, you know. And so I'm bound to get nervous towards the end. I'm bound to start thinking, oh, "Am I making the right decision?" So if you can anticipate all that, and as you say, not get caught up in my anxiety but rather make me feel better then obviously there's a greater chance of closing the deal listen the bottom line is everybody gets nervous at the end the sales professional gets nervous we're talking about money the prospect gets nervous because we're talking about money the reality is it causes us emotional pain when we spend money there's a lot of scientific research about that mm -hmm. that we spend money it causes emotional pain centers in our brain to become very active the same way as if our dog dies it's, mm -hmm. it's an emotional experience so we have to make sure that we are staying focused so that we don't get distracted by these things. At the end of the day, I tell people, listen, in sales, you have to be friendly, but not every prospect or customer is your friend. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to be the professional. At some point, you have to be the physician who delivers you know, the news. You have to have the surgery. We have to do this. It's in your best interest. And we have to be willing to kind of, uh, you know, what I, what I tell people, it, 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 it sounds a little corny, I guess, but you have to be willing to jeopardize the relationship. Some salespeople are so good at the relationship, they never move into closing because mm -hmm. they don't want to seem like the salesperson. You have to be both. You have to have the relationship, and then you have the courage, the conviction, the commitment to ask for the order and to hold this person accountable to the process. Right? It's not always fun to do, but listen, you know, as Zig Ziglar used to say, if you can't close, you're going to have skinny kids. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. At, at the end, this is why I teach salespeople whenever I talk to them. When, you're at, when you have that moment where you know you need to ask for the order, but you're afraid that they're going to be offended or you're afraid they're going to somehow be disappointed because all of a sudden you're a sales professional, think about this. Think about who's going to be disappointed if you don't ask for the order. You know who it is? It's your family. Mm -hmm. The people who count on you to bring home the bacon, right? To bring home the money, to pay the bills, to provide a quality of life. Um, am I going to disappoint them by being afraid to ask for the order? Or am I going to risk maybe, just maybe this, this prospect thinks I'm, a, I'm also a salesperson, if i got to disappoint somebody, I'm not going to disappoint my wife and kids. I'm never going to come home to my wife and kids and say, hey, guys, we can't go to Disneyland. We can't go to private school. We can't do this. We can't do that because I'm too big of a candy ass to ask for it. <laughs> never going to happen. Yeah. And by the way, I always say to people when this comes up is, I hate to break the news to you, but they know you're a salesperson. Exactly. I, it makes me crazy. People think that, oh, I don't want to seem like a salesman. They know why you're there. People aren't stupid. Yeah. People know what's going on. Exactly. Listen, Weldon, this has been fantastic. So um, just before we go, can you tell the people when the new book is coming out and um, a little bit more about you? Yeah. So uh, Consistency Selling comes out October 2nd. It's, it's available for pre-sale. Go to weldonlong.com. There's an offer we have. You click on, you buy the book through Amazon, you put your order number back in, and I, and I send out, we send out like an hour's worth of video training on the mindset mm -hmm. and the sales process. It's super, super powerful content, and we're just trying to promote the new book, so go to weldonlong.com and you'll see it, or go to consistencyselling.com and you'll see the offer. Great. Listen, this has been fantastic, Weldon. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert insight interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.